come up with a seven fluorosteroid that is rather effective in uh, treating something or other that steroids would be effective in treating. Uh, the uh, answer is, well, let's get your research group working on six and eight fluoro counterparts. They're, they're patentable, and out of those we'll certainly find something that would be of, of, of value. So you have the dictation, again, of research by the bottom uh, end, the B and its dollar sign. And this, you'd think, would be totally absolved in the area of private research. And in principle, it is, and in practice, not quite. There are a number of institutions, number of groups in the area that we're interested here, in the area of psychoactive drugs. You have the Hefter Foundation, you have the MAPS group, both of which have been very active in, in collecting, instituting funding, and seeing research projects get initiated that are for the, for the, the uh, discovering of information about uh, psychedelic drugs in general. But there's always this little smell of an agenda. Uh, not to take any of the, of the glory from any of these groups, the agenda is still there. Namely, we want to achieve these ends. Uh, you wish to achieve a certain amount of academic acceptability, a certain amount of social balance. These are all noble ends, but they are ends. And those ends in some way must be thought of by the person who's applying for a grant. Because he wants to get the grant, the grant is money, the grant will come from them, and I'll apply for it in a way that will give me a favorable review by the review board. Not a much of an influence, but not totally without. So this, this area is, unfortunately, still smells a little bit of the, of the A gives B, and the B is indeed the point from which the research starts. Anyway, with that, I want to get into a lecture uh, and how I got into the area and how what I want to talk about. But what I want to talk about is not the B, going this way, B. I want to talk about the arrow, but I'll tell how I got into it. I had it worked... First in industry, about 1950-something, or other, 55, 56. I went to Dow Chemical Company. I was never a total virgin in, in industry in, in that kind of chemistry. Here's a big laboratory, big equipment, big instruments, all the, anything you want to buy, you want to buy something, buy it, they'll buy it. And I thought, gee, this is marvelous, I can do whatever I want. Well, it didn't, they don't quite let you do whatever you want. They say, here's what we're interested in working on. And I was introduced to uh, my lab partner. He's a man who had been there a few years, Warren Kading from which I learned a great deal. I learned this entire process of look at the arrow and not look at the bee. I learned it from him. He's a kind of a remarkable person. He is a person who I learned two things immediately. One, when he found something went strangely in the laboratory, he would say, that's utterly bizarre. He did not know that b bizarre was pronounced bizarre, and he'd say bizarre. That's okay. Uh, the second one is one, I guess it's a little bit sexist, but I learned it from him, and it had its applicability. When something would really go wrong, he'd slam something on the floor. In fact, he kept a, lo a little line of broken beakers on the shelf. There's a wall at the end of the lab. And something went quite wrong, he'd pick up a beaker and throw it against the wall, smashing it. Well, the beaker's already been cracked, so it had no value. But just that throwing of the beaker, it just marvelous. It, it, gave, it, it expunged him of, any, uh, of his anger. Uh, but as things went generally bad in a generic sense, he'd mumble, grumble, and say, chemistry is a woman. <laughs> and we had a delightful, delightful, uh, we both had uh, technicians helping us, and they both were ladies, and somehow they got used to this from him, but it always struck me as a strange one. Anyway, uh, what he had, now here is my first experiment on transparent transparencies. If this, I, A and A. No. Yes. You're going to have to suffer dirty pictures. I call these dirty pictures because it always offends someone who thinks they're going to come up with pornography, but a lot of chemistry is pornography in disguise. You just have to know where to, where to look for the, for the functional group, so to speak. Um, anyway, uh, they, this is industry. They had toluene, you know, pennies a pound. And they could make benzoic acid for pennies a pound. And Warren discovered that if you put benzoic acid, that's the thing that's up there that I can point like, I can point there, you can see it. The one up in the middle at the top. You put it in with copper, copper salt, copper cupric this, cooper that, and throw fire to it, it went into phenol. Well, benzoic acid's pennies a pound, phenols many pennies a pound, and you go to a million tons, this is suddenly big money. And so that, that was his discovery that you could oxidize an acid to a phenol. Marvelous. So when I got there, he had been exploring the second line. They said, we need a lot of, of para uh, t, t, t butyl, that's a T butyl group, that's CCH33 at the bottom. Para T butyl phenol, why not take care of para T butyl toluene, pennies a pound, 
oxidizes the paratibutobenzoic acid and then oxidizes the paratibutophenol. We will not have a quiz on this later. This is just general information. He did it and it, he came out with the wrong thing. He got meta. That group was in the wrong place. Well, the group didn't move, the phenol moved, but he worked that out later. So suddenly he got something that he was not assigned to get. It was the wrong thing. The, the, the boss said, wrong product, bad scene, try again. That, that's the, the mindset on the B and how you get there. Warren said, wrong product, good scene. What went wrong? And that, of course, is the heart of the arrow. What went wrong? And he fiddled around with it and he found, by golly, it goes through a salicylic acid, decarboxylates here and the phenols over here and it goes metas from para or whatever. Anyway, got the wrong thing. That thing is a virtually unknown compound. And that's when I came into the industrial scene and that was available and said, what you can do with it? Well, this I took as almost being a freelance offer. And I looked at that thing. I said, gee, that's got the same carbon skeleton as physostigmine. And I drew down physostigmine down at the bottom here. And I guess I, I don't know, do I dare point? Yeah. Yeah. Here's a methyl. There's a methyl. There's a methyl. There's a carbon, just as there is in here. Methyl, 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 carbon. And there is a oxygen. So I bet, since the physostigmine is a real potent thing, and it's not that far from current insecticides, I'll wager you could take that T-butyl thing and put an amino group in the para position and make it dimethylate it, and maybe something, maybe a 3,5-dimethyl, I bet you get insecticide. So I had the wit, the skill, the luck to get six signatures attesting for that as being a good idea. So I had witnesses to the idea. I made the compound, and it went commercial as an insecticide. And so, they, of course, the person who ran the insecticide lab, the person who ran that lab, they, my boss, everyone along the line, tried to take all the credit for it, but I had six signatures and said I had thought it through and created it. I got the patent, and the people at the industry said, gee, if you have that kind of imagination that you can look at a structure and guess another structure that might be active, why don't you just do whatever you want to do? Uh, <laughs> And I did, and it was about five years later I left industry because <laughs> uh, what I wanted to do is nice, but not exactly what they wanted done. Uh, I got into the psychedelic drugs and spades, began making all kinds of neat things. I sent them in for biological screening. None of them were particularly active, but they weren't looking for what I thought they had and what I then later knew they did have. And so I was published for about two years out of Dow. And then they said, we're not comfortable with your publishing with Dow's address in this area. I said, okay, I live on my own street up there. I'll publish from my home address. I said, fine. So for about three years, I published from my home address, and it was getting more and more uncomfortable. So I split the scene, left industry, went back to school, and then became a consultant and got into things that I truly have enjoyed and that has been going ever since. So with this, I will now really start my lecture. Uh, am I under time constraint? I am. Uh, oh, uh, oh no. um, I have drawn here four more dirty pictures, phenethylamine, PEA, and this shows the direction I really am now going with great interest. Uh, PEA can cyclize that little amino group, hang it down, bring it down, hang it down, and stick in something, and you come up with tetrahydroisoquinone. The carbons are all there, plus one carbon. The, the, where that carbon comes from becomes quite an uh, interesting story. And so the PEA, and down here you have tryptamine, and tryptamine can do the same thing. Tryptamine has an amine hangling out there, which can duck around this way with a carbon and become tetrahydro beta carbonate. So there's a relationship between phenethylamines and tetrahydroisoquinolins, between tryptamines and tetrahydro beta carbonines. I have worked this trilogy quite thoroughly, and out of it, I still think they're coming. But the fourth ent entity is almost, is almost unknown up there. So I want to talk a little bit about Substitute phenethylamine is not an active compound. I mean, it's in this, it's in that. I've taken it up to a gram and a half, nothing. Uh, perhaps if you took some other maybe things that would inhibit its oxidation or metabolism, it might be, but as it stands, no. You put stuff on that ring, and that's, of course, one of the main areas. Right, right up in here, uh, without getting too technical, we put a methoxy, monosubstitute, little odds and ends, up to about mono, and into the dye substitution, get stimulants. Uh, but they still decompose in the body quite rapidly. You get two or more than two, you get psychedelics. You get up to about four or four and a half, four, four and a half, I'd love to get half a group onto a ring. Four or five on there, they begin losing all the activities of becoming inactive. So I played around in that area a great deal. The trimethoxy in that position with three methoxies around here 
was mescaline one, two, three. It's a compound mescaline, which is my first introduction into the entire area, personal introduction into the area of psychedelics. And I began making all kinds of modifications, put a methoxy here, up there, change them around, put a methyl 